Looks good. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, like, hello everyone. Um, thank you for tuning into this session today and thank you Professor Lim for the invite. Uh, I look forward, um, and also thank you um, Dr. Yang for sharing just now. I really look forward to hearing and learning from uh, everyone here. So uh, I'm uh, Keith, Head of Product Design at Carousel. Um, so in case anyone who is not familiar with Carousel, because I think we have people from uh, outside of Singapore calling in, right? So uh, basically Carousel is a second-hand uh, marketplace, uh, it's C2C. So I think the most uh, the equivalent I can think of like uh, in, in places like China will be like Xianyu and Zhuan Zhuan will be the equivalent um, of the, such a product in uh, other countries. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, prior to joining Carousel, I've been, uh, I've been in this, uh, the world of design for like quite a few years. Um, I come from a, I, I do have a background in uh, electrical and computer engineering, so very, very different from what I do today. I, I don't sort, uh, I don't do any circuit, circuit boards these days, uh, but really I uh, focus on um, studying people and actually designing products you know, for, for them. Um, I'm also personally interested in the area of sustainability uh, because I believe that um, uh, design has a role to play to solve like some of the world's biggest problem. Um, also, you know, as a designer, you know, things that we create will someday end up in a landfill. So I think there's also some sort of responsibility that, you know, that we have. Um, so outside of uh, IDEO, you know, I'm also an ex-co member at uh, DBCS, uh, just not uh, like what Professor Lin has mentioned. Uh, so recently we hosted a sustainability related design challenge with uh, a ministry in Singapore. Uh, actually, we called designers to submit proposals on how we can build more sustainable products. Um, because, you know, Singapore is very small. Um, and actually, there's one thing that I learned is that by 2035, uh, our last landfill will be like, filled up. So we have no other options. And we actually need to learn about how um, to create this circular economy and learn to be, how to be more sustainable. Um, and sustainability sounds like a super big thing, right? Like we have countries meeting to talk about it. We have people protesting over it um, and companies are uh, pledging to be more sustainable. Uh, we have people, you know, spending more money, you know, to, for like the sustainable options. Um, but, you know, they, these options tend to be more expensive these days. Um, but today, my focus is not about uh, these people. Um, my focus today are the people whom uh, I get to meet uh, through my work every day, you know. So the pe these people don't go on stages to give speeches, um, but their impact their impact might be actually very small on an individual basis. But you know, as a community community coming together, uh, I think their individual impact will accumulate into some like a movement, uh, which is what we call the circular economy. Um, and these are the people rehoming and repurposing uh, items so that you know, they don't end up in an incinerator or a landfill, at least not so soon. You know, we, we'll try to extend the lifespan of an item as much as possible. Uh, I really want to focus on talking about uh, the motivations, uh, the why you know, like, uh, behind um, these people participating in the circular economy. Um, so it's going to be more like a descriptive essay. Um, I, today we don't have any means to detect motivation, so I was hoping you know to hear something about uh, from Dr. Yang about you know, can we detect you know uh, motivations, emotions a lot more uh, effectively. Uh, yeah, so what I what I have is really more like a descriptive essay, a collection of stories uh, about these uh, motivations. So the the first group of uh, people in the circular economy will be um, this uh, I call them the environmentally conscious. So. Uh, generally, you know, they, they believe in not wasting. So these are the ideal users in the circular economy, right? They care about minimizing their environmental impact. So they buy and sell secondhand, you know, even if it takes a, a bit of effort and time. Um, so we also hear that you no know, people are breaking away from the tradition to wear brand new clothes for Chinese New Year. So you know, uh, we have as Chinese, we have this tradition. Every uh, uh, Chinese New Year, we we need to buy new outfits. Um, so you can see that people are pe uh, peeling away from the tradition. It's quite a bit of effort, especially if you have to convince like your very uh, traditional elders you know, in the family. Um, so uh, Insia is one of our users on Carousel. Uh, she actually goes the extra mile to spruce up her furniture before selling them on the platform. 
So for, uh, I'll play this video uh, in a short while. So from this video, you can see how she is motivated to minimize her environmental impact and how she also enjoys the process. Because I just signed up for a workshop at the Big Blue Trunk and they sell the chalk paints. And I really found it very therapeutic uh, to paint on furniture. So it helped me come out of a bit of a rough patch after like, a circuit breaker and whole change of identity from working full-time to full-time parent. That became like my uh, meditative space. Yeah. Being someone who always likes things new and shiny, it's quite a pleasure to make it new and shiny again. There really is a lot of joy that you can get out of it. And like anything else, even as humans, like we want purpose. So even things have a purpose. We like to stretch it as long as possible. <laughs> the first few pieces were free. Uh, people were so grateful. Like They're like, wow, this is so nice. And you, you can see the lights on carousel. I was like, wow, <laughs> uh, that means there's some response. Um, at least people are watching it, you know? So. Then it kind of encouraged me to, to do more. Some of our other efforts include buying secondhand um, everything, and that, that reduces the demand for new, and whatever's already made can be extended as much as possible. And whatever you have also, you need to use it. It might even be more costly, but uh, it just means that you're not using more. Yeah. So like in CI is uh, definitely the kind of users that we want, like we want them uh, on the platform, right? Because they really believe in the, the mission. Uh, so moving on, uh, I want to talk about the second group of users. So these are the group they say who will say like, I want to get some money. Uh, in fact, this is actually among our earliest group of users on Carousel. Uh, because being able to turn underutilized items at home into cash is a very strong intrinsic motivation. Uh, you, we, do, we don't need uh, any bells and whistles, just the fact that you can get money out from doing something is a strong enough motivation. Um, so you can see here students selling their textbooks. Um, so I actually, I, in fact, I, I studied in the States uh, back then. Um, so I don't know why, but some textbooks are actually quite way cheaper in Singapore uh, during my time. Uh, so I, I buy it from a bookshop at Clementi. Um, so on top of selling my own used textbooks, I was also buying extra textbooks uh, to sell them on the campus marketplace for a small profit. Um, and then we also uh, have people selling clothes, um, maybe so that they can buy more clothes, uh, I, I don't know. Um, because you know, if you if we really want to max out on sustainability, you will want to wear the clothes as long as possible. You know, after, you look, um, after the clothes is old, you turn them into pajamas, you turn them into rags, uh, you will still be better than, but then I think uh, getting these people to sell their clothes on carousel or on a second-hand marketplace is still better than throwing the clothes away. Um, then I have the third group of users. Um, so these are the group of users who say um, they don't give me joy anymore. So I like to call this group of uh, people the Marie Kondos. They, they want to have a minimalist lifestyle. You know, they declutter for a certain aesthetic at home. Um, and, and sometimes you know, this, this declutter also have a very urgent need uh, to do so. So, um, you know, like for example, if you are moving houses, uh, you're leaving the country, you, know, you need to get it out of the house by a certain date. Um, so that is why on our marketplace, uh, we pay a lot of attention to how fast listings get sold. Um, because you know, we also notice that after a period of time, uh, people do lose interest. Like if they see a listing uh, that has been listed for like, you know, three, four months, uh, usually people will, will kind of suspect, you know, is there something wrong uh, with the item? Uh, so, but then I think we are looking at um, very specific use cases uh, among our users. So some of them, um, have this urgent need, and we also would like to support them. And this is also the reason why we launch a, a free category on Carousel. So uh, I think one of our primary goal at, at, at the beginning was to introduce goodwill to the marketplace. Uh, but actually what we realized is that uh, it actually um, giving things away for free actually help uh, people declutter even faster. 
So earlier on, when you when you want to list something, um, it might take you a few days, a few weeks, or even months, you know, to, to kind of get a check and then get the thing out of your house. But uh, when I what I personally experienced is when I listed something for free, uh, within like half an hour, I will get ten checks. Everybody wants something for free, uh, and I want to get it out of my house. Uh, so I think that there there is a match here. Um, so I, actually, this these are all the listings that um, I sort of like, I just took the images from the free category uh, one evening. Um, actually, I, the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that I, I personally was giving away for free. Um, I had to declutter a whole bunch of uh, gardening pots because all my succulents died, unfortunately. Um, and then um, I have a lot of uh, design books that you know, I no longer use. I just want to sort of give them you know, away like, to younger design students. Um, so definitely, I think I wasn't thinking of like monetizing from um, this item. I was thinking more like I just want it out of my house. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it was just before Chinese New Year. So I have a certain deadline uh, to get that out of my house. Uh, so now we are on to the next uh, group of uh, users here. Uh, so this is the group of people who uh, still also, I think, uh, similar to a previous group, uh, it's about cost about money uh, but these are the uh, more on the buyer side so they want to buy something cheap uh, sometimes it's for a hobby uh, it's for like a temporary thing like covid uh, because you no know, i think back in, uh, when during the start of covid we never expected uh, our work from home situation to last for so long so i think people who are still thinking maybe i'll buy a second hand table uh, temporarily or i'll buy a chair you know because uh, maybe i'll just need to work from home for six months uh, max so i think that there is a reason for why people want to buy something like cheaper um, so then i think like saving is um, their primary motivation uh, environment is more like a side benefit so because of this you know as a platform we are also very mindful about how our sellers price their secondhand items uh, so when you list an item we actually use uh, quite a fair amount of machine learning to help you uh, price your item reasonably. So uh, here I have another video to show. Uh, so this is Nadia and uh, Rich One. Uh, so they are they aren't about they aren't you no know, it's not everything about cheap things. They they care about the environment as well. But I, I think this video I just want to highlight um, how you know uh, savings is also an important value to them. And also in, increasingly we we are also seeing. Um, if we grow our users based on the different generation, we are seeing the, the generation of millennials uh, becoming homeowners these days. And they, they are actually very strong supporters of sustainability. They are the ones looking out for um, uh, like secondhand furniture to use uh, in their homes. I think we would have saved between 25 to 50%. Yeah, um, it is really as much as that. There are a lot of things on any of these, you know, um, secondhand, uh, you know, like resellers. And we have saved so much from doing that. Um, of course, it means that you have to accept a bit of, you know, like flaws, a bit of chips, dents, but uh, we but don't mind those. Character, yeah. yeah, yeah, it really does help to add character. It's doing all that you can to live sustainably while not you know, like completely overwhelming yourself and being put off it all together. Not many people are aware, but there's just so much furniture out there that is secondhand, and people are, are ready to let it go. They don't necessarily list it on carousel or whatnot, but there's just so much used furniture out there. If we had a bigger home, we'd order it. Yeah, so you can um, see like how um, they, they really calculate like how the, the savings that they have and uh, I think I, I, from them, I can see that they, they do care about the environment and just that savings is like a sweetener as well, right? So I think in looking at all this motivation, of course, uh, we cannot be so like uh, categorical, like oh, you belong to this group, you belong to that group. I think humans are a lot more complex. Uh, when we do something, there's a lot of reasons why we want to do it. Uh, so I think in this case for this couple, it's really about the environment, it's about the character of used furniture uh, and also savings. Here are the best things I got from Carousel. This was my very first purchase and I really wanted an easel to help with my paintings and I got it at half the price. Now this was something 
something that I've been eyeing on for the longest time and I was lucky enough to find something similar that was listed for a fraction of the price and look at that, it really looks brand new. This I would say would be my best purchase yet because I saved the most and I'm just going to let the numbers do the talking. <laughs> Yeah, so I moved from like the millennials to the Gen Zs already, like from the YouTube era to the TikTok era. Uh, so I, you can see that actually like cost saving is uh, something is, I think it's across generation. Uh, like I think even our, our parents, our grandparents' generation would really appreciate uh, the cost savings uh, from buying secondhand if the, if the item is still uh, good, uh, still good to use. Yep. So then, uh, so this is the next group of users. Um, here we are talking about thrifting. Um, so, so I'm yeah. This is like going down to, into a, uh, almost like the Gen Z uh, uh, population. So these are the this is the generation who thinks that thrifting is cool. Uh, we are seeing more and more um, like Gen Zs um, taking to thrifting as a hobby. So it works very well with their limited budget. So I think a lot of the students, you know, in the universities. Will also um, resonate with that, uh, and also there's a certain cool factor with thrifting these days. So you are no longer buying from the big brands; you are kind of picking out individual pieces, almost like kind of shopping at the flea market. Uh, and what you wear is an expression of yourself; is also a statement of uh, your beliefs. Um, so in, actually, in 2019, uh, we saw from a survey that around 40% of Gen Zs uh, were uh, were buying secondhand compared to 30% uh, in 2016. So you can see that the, the percentage is kind of getting more and more. So it's a trend that we cannot ignore. So um, these are two vi videos I found on TikTok when I searched for thrifting. Um, so the, actually the lady on the left uh, is also someone we work with at Carousel. Um, she, I mean she, she's a Carousel user, but we, we featured her in some marketing campaign before. So her IG handle is uh, Chinchilla Vintage. Um, so very cool person. Um, she gives tips on how to uh, fix coats uh, if they are too tight or too loose. and. Uh, she loves like she loves to buy fashion right? she loves to experiment uh, mix and match uh, so you can see that she has a she has a big wardrobe uh, but how she does it is you no know, she, she really uh, just um, buy exclusively from, uh, from secondhand store so she can control her budget at the same time so be responsible to the to the um, environment so something that we learned about uh, the, the the young people these days is um, like all, all this conversation about global warming, about sustainability, it's what they hear since they are young. So there is no need, uh, so I think it's pretty much in their system. There's no need to sugarcoat it. There's no need to convince them. Uh, so uh, I think they have more or less integrated, uh, they have more or less inherited the problem uh, and they are actually quite active in wanting to find solutions for themselves. But something we see from this behavior, um, you know, this, 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 there is this thing where something can be so good that it's bad. <laughs> um, and it, it, is it is not happening in this part of the world yet. But I think uh, what we saw is also people are also questioning about the environmental and ethical threats from thrifting. Um, so I think what we saw was, um, like, like, so if you sell and buy secondhand, you do incur shipping costs. Uh, and then shipping, shipping transport will then uh, contribute to carbon emissions. So thrifting can also drive the prices of secondhand uh, items up. So if uh, what we see, like uh, someone can buy a, a piece of cloth at five dollars from a thrift shop, maybe do some upcycling or do some styling with it and sell it for like thirty dollars. So that's like I don't know, five. That's like six times more. But I mean, there, there is some value uh, added to the item. Uh, I'm not denying that. But I think 
what uh, what has happened is uh, maybe someone really needed that piece of cloth at five dollars, but it's it's priced out second hand. So I think there is these issues that we we hear from the other second hand marketplaces in uh, in in US in Europe. Uh, so we see this we see this as an emerging trend. Um, so what I think what we what at the heart of all this issue is still overconsumption. Um, so I think yes we want to shift people to a second hand uh, from buying first hand to buying second hand. But at the same time we also need to look at problems around overconsumption. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would say that we don't have this problem yet, but we don't have to, we, we need to bring enough people into the second hand, into the circular economy first, uh, before we look at the problems of uh, overconsumption. Um, so this is the last group of users that I will share today. Uh, so these are makers, these are storytellers. Um, they have they have a lot of valuable skills that, that they can contribute to the circular economy. Uh, so Heng Ling is uh, one of the users on Carousel. So his hobby is to find broken electronics on Carousel, repair them and list them on Carousel to sell. So uh, to the Carousel users out there in the audience, if you have things that are broken, right, you can still sell them, you know, don't throw them away. Because there are people like Heng Ling who actually can see the value in them. He can, he can, fix, he can fix your broken electronics. At the point of time, um, the Xbox console that I actually gotten was destined for the landfill. There was nothing that was going to save it until I stepped in. Hi, I'm Hien Ling. I'm 22 years old this year. So by fixing up this console, I managed to give it a second life. I always wanted the Xbox since I was a kid, but I never managed to save up enough for it. So I decided to take up this challenge and I managed to find the $1 broken capacitor in the Xbox. By switching out this capacitor, I managed to have a fully functional console. And it was amazing when I started it up again and played on it. It was like bringing something dead back to life again. Yeah, so Heng Ling definitely has very unique skills. I'm sure a lot of students at SUTD will also uh, can probably do the same. Uh, they can consider um, yeah, creating some side income for themselves you know, with their skills. Um, so this is another example uh, of maker in the circular economy. Uh, so Samula is a uh, social enterprise. Um, in fact, when I ran the challenge, um, the design challenge, at the, which I mentioned at the start of my talk, uh, they, they were one of the finalists uh, for the Singapore Design Award. So, um, and then, then there is this another cafe called Forward Coffee. It's a cafe. Uh, I think they have an outlet at NUS. Um, so what Samula and uh, Forward uh, did was they, they worked together, they, um, they recycled all the milk bottles that uh, Forward Cafe was using. So looking at this white and blue, uh, and, then they, and then made it into furniture, so like what you see here. So looking at the white and blue sort of uh, texture, print, I don't know, I have some guesses like what brand of uh, milk uh, this cafe used. Um, but you know, this is something very visual, right? So every time you see it, you're reminded of the environment that we need to protect. Um, so I think this is not just a uh, thing about recycling the milk bottle, it's also storytelling, uh, trying to get more people to care about the environment. So today, the, the staff at the cafe also, uh, will, they still continue to collect the milk bottles for recycling. Um, yeah, so I quickly covered like the six types of people in the circular economy. So some are here for the environment, others are here for other reasons, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so in order for us to achieve the impact that we want for the environment, uh, we need to design our circular economy to be more inclusive. So the, I think the education work is still very important. We still need to educate people like why, why they need to um, extend the lifespan of the items. But I think in parallel, we also need to understand what motivates people uh, and draw them in. Um, yeah. So if, you know, if there is some technology for us to understand that and we can cater uh, some uh, experiences based on your motivation, that would be great. Um, so this is some research that Carousel did uh, for our re-commerce index uh, report. So this is the maximum number of numbers I can show you. Um, so you can see from the first set of numbers, actually less than half of the people are here for the environment. Uh, when we ask them, uh, like, yeah, why, why are you um, buying second hand? So Hong Kong is highest at 45%, and that's even less than half. Uh, the users who like they care about the environment. So, but you can see a lot of people are here because of the value for money. It's like 
70 80% um, so I mean this is just for like the people um, whom we whom we survey so I'm sure the number will be bigger you know, when we look outside of the survey um, that there, there will be people who uh, still don't buy or sell secondhand uh, because of a lot of reasons so I think what we need to see the opportunity is that you know, there are still unmet needs uh, today uh, such that you know, people are not participating in the circular economy um, yeah so I think we we'll, we really want to understand the motivation and address them you know, one by one yeah so with that uh, thank you for tuning into the talk Thank you so much, Keith. Um, that was a fascinating presentation and I think you really brought to life a platform, you know, where usually we just see the numbers, we see the products, we see the uh, prices of things, but we don't necessarily see that human story behind it. And I love how you introduced to us the different groups of carousel users, you know, from the Marie Kondos, the declutterers, to those who are... Um, really creative about repurposing things and also to those who are fundamentally motivated by savings. And I think regardless of the motivations, as long as the platform is able to bring people together to have um, engaged in environmentally sustainable practices, then I think um, it would really be uh, considered a huge success. So while the audience um, warms up uh, to submit their questions, I did want to ask you, Keith, um, a very interesting question, which is that I myself was rather averse to buying secondhand clothing. Um, I had a bit of the eek factor, but my teenage daughter was buying all kinds of things and I was stunned by how good the quality was of secondhand clothing. And I also felt that it was very encouraging to see young people not having that eek factor and embracing these kinds of sustainable purchases. So my question to you is, how can design, uh, how can platforms like Carousel be designed to address these kinds of hesitancy or resistance, this kind of people with the eek factor about upcycling and secondhand goods? Yeah, so, um, okay, I, I'm, I, I'm probably also the same, right? Like, in terms of, like, secondhand clothes, I'm like, like should, I, should, I, um, should, should I even consider it? Like, I have, I have no qualms buying, like, furniture, electronics, because, like, they, they are in the space, but they don't, um, I don't know, they are, they are not on me. So, but with clothing, I'm, you know, I, I get a bit more personal. Um, but I think what, what we saw on the, actually, interestingly on our platform, uh, a good amount of our inventory is uh, brand new clothes. It's just that people bought it, never wore it. It was always on the hanger. Some even still had a, a tag uh, attached to it. So, um, yeah, so actually these are as good as buying from the shop. So I think on a plat from a platform uh, perspective, we, we are thinking that we need to do better in helping people discover like, what, what, they, uh, what they need and what they want you know, from this second-hand marketplace. Um, so I think on, that's, that's on one, one hand of it. I think some of like maybe uh, if you buy it like uh, once or uh, if you wore it once or twice, they are actually also as good as new. I mean, you buy from a shop, someone had tried, tried on the clothes before already, before you, right? So, um, yeah, so I think on the platform, we need to organize our inventory a lot uh, better and also help people discover um, the, the kind of second hand that, that they're comfortable with. Then I think on another hand, it's also about, I think, um, I think what, what makes second hand tick for the, 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 the young people these days is the cool factor. So I think um, there's also something that we will need to look at. Um, in fact, some of the uh, actually more some of the more expensive clothing, um, uh, we also we also see that you know, there is quite a bit of demand for it. Uh, so let's say you're looking at brands like you know, Prada or like Gucci, like they, they do have a lot of very good quality uh, items. Uh, some are like limited collect uh, limited uh, collections. Uh, so actually, these are also highly coveted. Uh, I think we also need to figure out you know, um, what is it that people want and how can we uh, surface it to them. Wonderful. I, I'm happy to report that another bonus is I actually found a dress that was sold out at the store, but a few months later, someone sold a twice worn version of it for half the price that I would have had to pay. So <laughs> you can uh, consider me a happy convert to the upcycling uh, pool. Um, so thank you so much, Keith, for that excellent sharing. Um, so good to you know learn more about a platform that I'm a very, very fond 